good morning everyone um today i'm having to you know do the session from home because um i had some transportation problems uh, so um, if we could have anyone online you know open with a word of prayer uh, we can then uh, begin the class please if anyone could pray and commit the class into the lord's hands please father god thank you lord almighty god we praise you lord god father thank you lord god for this time that you've given us as your children lord god to come to your presence lord god even now lord god as we learn from your word father god father we pray lord god that you would help each of us lord god to learn from you father god father we pray lord god the holy spirit will minister to each and every one of us lord god father we come at the entire class into your hands lord god father even as we are lord even the climate and all the changes and the weather changes are going on father we pray that you will protect each and every one of us be with us and guide us lord in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so much yeah just a minute um yes let's begin yeah so today we will uh, look at um, john chapter 17 and go all the way up to chapter 19 Okay, so John 17 to 19 is the uh, portion that we would be covering today. Let's start off with John chapter 17. Uh, if we could maybe begin by reading out the first five verses. So today, if we could have different persons, you know, just reading out um, the portions, uh, that will kind of, you know, help us to stay involved in the class and also keep us alert. So John chapter 17 verses 1 to 5, if any one person could read out, please. John chapter 17, verse 1 to 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Yeah, now this is the prayer which Jesus is praying. Um, it's uh, It sets an example for us on uh, how a prayer should be prayed. Let's look at the opening lines of this prayer. It says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Now look at the opening line. Uh, Jesus is praying and asking that the father would glorify him. It sounds like a rather selfish prayer. But look at the explanation that he gives. He says, Lord, I'm asking you to glorify me uh, so that I may glorify you. So that is the opening line of this prayer, where the emphasis is not on Jesus himself. The emphasis is on the glorification of the Father. And uh, that should be our attitude even as we go to the Lord in prayer where we are not just asking for things which will benefit us, uh, which will probably you know, lead to our um, being blessed or our being glorified. But whatever we are praying, we should, be, we should pray with an attitude where we want the Lord, the Father, to be ultimately glorified. So we see this um, um, attitude of complete um, lack of self-promotion in Jesus, you know. Uh, he is not interested in promoting himself. He is always focused on promoting the Father. And so anyone who prays with that kind of an attitude, 
will obviously have all their prayers answered because they are not praying out of selfishness, but rather they are praying that others may be benefit benefited and so that the uh, and so that the lord's name you know may be exalted so um this is the uh, the the example that is presented to us right at the beginning of this prayer and then uh, jesus moves on to other uh, you know themes and aspects let's look at um the next thing which is mentioned in verses 2 to 3 uh, he says you know um you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him now this is eternal life that they know you the only true god this is the way jesus def uh, you know defines eternal life this is the definition that he gives for eternal life eternal life is not a ticket to heaven eternal life is not just the forgiveness of sins eternal life is knowing you is what jesus says he says eternal life is literally knowing the father that is eternal life because people you know generally have the impression that if i'm able to enter into heaven that is eternal life if i'm um, if god can forgive me of all my sins that is eternal life but at the very core of this concept of eternal life what is it it is literally knowing god that is eternal life all the others are side benefits of eternal life but at the core of it eternal life this gift of salvation that is given to us at the core of it the the main gift is that now we know god personally now we have an intimate relationship with him so salvation is um, um you know knowing god is not just a means to an end where we are not approaching him and saying lord i want to have a relationship with you so that i can be blessed lord i want to have a relationship with you so that you know my problems can be solved um he is not the means to other ends he is the primary goal he is the primary end you know so um again we see another priority being brought out in this prayer of jesus first we saw that his entire focus is on exalting the father second now we are seeing um that eternal life is knowing him that should be our main goal to have a relationship with him to draw close to him the benefits that we are going to get the blessings that will be ours the entry into heaven the eternal life that we will enjoy the resurrected bodies that we will receive these are all side benefits but at the, the core of it eternal life is knowing him and having a relationship with him that should be the you know the treasured uh, position that we should be aiming for so another thing that we see in this prayer of jesus the third thing that we see in this prayer of jesus that would be in verses um 11 maybe we can look at verses 11 to 15 if someone could read out for us um john 17 verses 11 to 15 please 11 to 15 john 17 now i am not longer no longer in the world but these are in the world and i come to you holy are in the world and i come to you holy father keep pro your name those who you have given me that they may be one as we are while i was with them in the world i kept them in your name those whom you gave me i have kept and none of none of them is lost except the son of prediction prediction that the scripture might be fulfilled but now i come to you and these things i speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them your word and the world world has hated them because they are not of the world just as i am not of the world i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one yeah so at the beginning of the prayer um jesus talked about 
how the father receives first priority, how he should be exalted, how he should be glorified. Now he's coming to the second main focus where he's concerned about his flock, about his followers, his disciples. And he's talking about how he longs to protect them and keep them. And he says, Lord, I'm, uh, he's, he's saying to the father, I'm not saying that you should, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm not saying that you should remove them from the world. Yes, they will continue to live in the world. They will continue to face the trials and difficulties that are there, the challenges which are there in the world. But I'm asking you to keep them and protect them from the evil one. So now Jesus is focusing on his flock. And he says that, um, you know, he says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, he says in verse 11. And in uh, uh, verse uh, 14, in verse 15, he says, protect them from the evil one. So the emphasis over here is on how protection is possible only through the power of the name of God and only through his enabling. You know, so in Jude 124, this is what it says. It says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence. He's the only one who can protect us. He's the only one who can keep us in such a way that, you know, we do not stumble, that we will stay faithful to the end and receive our eternal reward. So Jesus first focuses on the glory of God. Second, he focuses on his flock and prays for their protection. And then um, from there, let's move to the third point which Jesus prays for. That would be in verses uh, 17 onwards. If we could have someone read out for us, 17 to 19, please. The third point, in uh, the third main point in Jesus' prayer. John 17, 17 to 19. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're able to hear me? Oh, yes. Yes. And as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Yeah. So after asking the Lord to protect them by the power of his name and to keep his flock from the evil one, now he is asking for their sanctification, the third main point in Jesus' prayer. And how is this flock going to be sanctified? He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. That word sanctify, it's talking about his people being set apart. And how are the people of God set apart? They can only be set apart by the truth of God's word. You see, um, the world corrupts us. Uh, the world contaminates us with its wrong values, with its wrong priorities. And God takes us from this contaminated world and he sets us apart through his word. We, his word teaches us the truth. It shows us how these other things are not up to his standards. So his word shows us what is true, what is actually better, what is more beneficial. And so once we understand this truth, it gives us that inspiration, that encouragement, that motivation which we need to set ourselves apart from the corruption of the world. So Jesus' prayer over here is, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Why did uh, the Father send Jesus into the world? To serve the world, but not to be contaminated by the world. So in the same way that Jesus was sent, to serve the Lord, serve the world and sacrifice himself for the world, but at the same time not to be contaminated by it. In that same way, Jesus is, has now is now sending us into the world. And we are meant to serve this world. 
we are meant to you know make sacrifices in in uh, ministering to them so our focus should be on uh, being salt and light in in being a blessing to them but at the same time we should guard ourselves and keep ourselves apart set apart from the world and how is that possible it is only possible even as we meditate upon his word and the truth of his word starts sinking into our hearts and we begin to realize that what he is offering is higher better and that truth becomes so ingrained inside us that we no longer feel attracted to the things of the world but we are attracted to the things of righteousness so it's the truth which enables us opens our eyes and enables us to see how much higher what he is offering is rather than what the world is offering you know so only the truth can open our eyes and enable us to literally sanctify ourselves and set ourselves apart from the world so that we can serve it in the right way be salt and light but at the same time not be contaminated by this world so jesus says in the same way that you sent me and now i am sending them and therefore you know sanctify them by your truth and then from there jesus comes to the fourth main point in his prayer that would be uh, verse 21 onwards um, if we could have someone read out for us uh, verses uh, 21 to 24 if someone could read out verses 21 to 24 verse 21 to 24 that they all may be one as you father in me and i in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be one just as we are one in i in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me father i desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where i am that they may behold my glory which you gave you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world yes so here in the fourth point um jesus is talking about unity and glory uh, he says over here um that all of them may be one father just as you are in me and i am in you he is he wants the people of god to have that same level of unity which exists between the father and the son uh, so jesus does not say that there should be um uniformity because you know people belong to different races different cultures um their uh, the way they express themselves will be different so Jesus never demands uniformity because he has created people with different personality types and with different interests and uh, different ways of expressing themselves but he does require unity so there's a distinction you know so uh, we are all we all worship the lord in different ways so there is no uniformity but there has to be unity where we come together and we have one purpose and that that is to exalt him to lift him high rather than lifting ourselves you know so um jesus does require unity from us even though he does not uh, you know demand uniformity from us so in line with this unity you know in speaking in line with this thought he says in verse 22 i have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one he says the glory which you gave me you know the father which the father gave now i have given them that glory what does this mean in what what kind of a glory has jesus given us um we catch a glimpse of that in romans 8 29 to 30 in what way has jesus given us uh glory romans 8 
29 to 30, if we could have someone read out, that will help us understand in what way God has given us glory and in what, uh, what role does that play regarding unity. Romans 8, 29 to 30. Romans 8, 29 to 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, this he also glorified. All the believers, you know, who are now part of the flock of God, uh, flock of Jesus, they all have been given the glory which Jesus received from the Father in the sense they are all going to be confirmed to the image of the Son. We are all going to be in the same image as the Son. That is the glory which you know we have, which has been bestowed upon us. That day after day we are going to become more and more into His likeness. We are going to resemble Him more and more. That is the ultimate glory that we can have. Where people look at us and they see Christ in us. They think that they they see that we are so Christ-like in our attitudes, in our conduct, in our choices. Uh, so. That is the glory which has been bestowed upon us. And why has this glory been so generously given to all of us? That they may be one as we are one. So no believer has to be jealous of another believer. We all are being um, transformed and being made into the likeness and image of Jesus himself. So there's no need for any jealousy. There's no need for any competition. This glory has been freely given to every single believer. All of us are going to have this uh, of the uh, to, are going to have the status of becoming like Jesus. So there's no need for any jealousy or competition between us. The only difference lies in our giftings. Where some people have, uh, you know, maybe one type of gifting and another may have another type of gifting. When it comes to glory, we all share the same glory. All of us are going to be made one day into the exact image of the sun. So when it comes to that status, we all have the same glory. When it comes to giftings and rewards, there it's there's a there's a slight difference uh, because different people have different giftings. And when it comes to standards of the world, different giftings will you know, um, draw wealth, power, and influence um, to different levels when it comes to the worldly perspective. Because yes, it is true. Some giftings tend to draw more wealth, tend to draw more attention, tend to draw more influence. And there are some giftings which people don't regard as very important. And all of this is from a worldly perspective. So when it comes to exercise of giftings, some are considered more valuable by the world, and some are considered less valuable by the world. But in the eyes of God, whatever giftings he has given are important to him in his eyes. And as long as we are fulfilling those giftings you know, to the best of our ability, the Lord is satisfied. Um, and when it comes to rewards, he looks at how sincerely we have practiced those giftings. He does not consider certain giftings more glamorous than others. You know, it's the world which regards certain giftings as more glamorous than others. What he is looking for when it comes to rewards, he what he's looking for is with what sincerity we practiced those giftings. So the glory given to us. It's the same for all believers. All of us are going to be confirmed to the image of the sun. When it comes to giftings, yes, we do have different giftings. And the world grades our giftings differently. It may consider um, a preacher or an, or an evangelist more important than someone who has the gift of hospitality or maybe the gift of administration. Okay, So the world may rate our giftings differently. But in the eyes of the Lord, all giftings are equal 
and when it comes to rewards he rewards people based on how sincerely they have used the giftings given to them he does not consider one gifting more important than another so based on this all of us are one so there's no need for any sense of jealousy or competition between believers okay so um this is the aspect which jesus is bringing out over here in this prayer so when we look at the prayer of jesus there are four things that we see first our entire attitude when we come in prayer should be lord i'm going to be praying things which will exalt you i'm going to be praying things which will place your priorities first i'm going to be praying things which will benefit not just me but benefit the people around me that is the first thing the second thing which we draw from jesus prayer is the concern which he has for his flock so in the same way the people whom god has placed in our charge you know we pray for them uh, the ones that we are ministering to or the ones that who are there in our family or the ones with whom we work in a in a in, in a in an office setting so these people uh, when we come to the lord in prayer he expects us to have a love and concern towards them third uh, point is regarding sanctification uh so when we come to the lord in prayer we pray that we will be people who have the truth of the word in us which will enable us to keep ourselves away set apart from the corruptions of the world and fourthly unity unity is the thing which jesus emphasizes as the fourth point where because we all have equal status because we all have um, um different giftings but uh you know they in god says they are of equal value we all do have an equal footing in god says so therefore we don't need to compete with one another but rather we can maintain unity so in our own prayer we can choose to focus on these four main points of unity sanctification love and concern for the people whom god has placed in our charge and firstly you know whatever we pray for it should honor and exalt him this can be the four aspects that we focus on in our own prayers moving on from there into john chapter 18 we will look at the details of jesus arrest and his uh, trial before the uh, religious leaders as well as before pontius pilate so in john chapter 18 um if we could maybe read out verses Two to six, please. John eighteen two to six. John chapter eighteen verse two to six, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and office from the chief priests and the Pharisees. came there with lanterns torches and weapons jesus therefore knowing all things that would come upon him went forward and said to them whom are you seeking they answered him jesus of nazareth jesus said to them i am he and judas who betrayed him also stood with them then when he said to them i am he they drew back and fell to the ground all right uh, so in this chapter uh, we see that jesus and his disciples have come to the garden of gethsemane and judas has now coming to betray him um it says over here that they uh, that the soldiers come uh to make the arrest carrying torches lanterns and weapons so from that we learn that it is night time uh why are they coming in the night time because they know that what they are about to do is crooked they don't want to do it in daylight in public in front of people uh, because that will expose their hypocrisy so what they are doing is crooked what they are doing is wrong and so they do it in the cover of night and that is why they needed judas help they needed judas to 
lead them to Jesus at a point when nobody is around, when you know, when they can actually do what they are, you know, scheming and strategizing to do. Uh, so uh, Judas was supposed to watch out for an opportune moment when you know Jesus would be isolated, and then he was supposed to go and intimate the the leaders about this so that they can come and make the arrest at the right point of time. So that's basically what Judas was being paid for. And so when Ma Judas is now aware that Jesus will be coming to the Garden of Gethsemane, so he hurries off to inform the uh, the, you know, the religious leaders about it. And so uh, the when Jesus is alone here in the garden at nighttime with his disciples, you have the detachment of soldiers and officials coming to make an arrest and it says uh, jesus speaks to them and he says who is it you want and they say jesus of nazareth and then jesus says i am that is the divine name which he uses um how do we recognize this you know this um we see the word i am uh, we see the phrase i am in various places in the in the Gospel of John, how do we know in which place it is uh, the divine name which Jesus is referring to, and in which place it is just simply a phrase, a sentence, you know, uh, that is being used? Because Jesus says, "I am the light." He says, "I am the bread." Um, um, he says, "I am the living waters." So, in, in various places, he refers to himself as "I am," and it's just a phrase. It's just part of a sentence that he is using it. But in some places, he says, I am, and he is using it in the sense of divinity. Um, so how do, we, how, how do we differentiate and how would we know? In the Greek, wherever this phrase, divine phrase, I am, is used, it is used without any nouns or verbs or adverbs or adjectives attached to it. It's a standalone phrase. You just have the phrase, I am. And next to that, you don't have any noun or verb or adjective or adverb. And so in English, when they were doing the translation, because I am would sound grammatically wrong in English, they tend to add the word he. OK, so I am he is basically how it gets translated in the English Bibles. So wherever you see this phrase, I am he in the English Bible, you will know that it's talking about the divine term. So in the Greek, there's no he attached. It's just literally just I am. OK, so um, so here, when they say we are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus says, I am. And when he speaks that divine name of his, it says, they drew back and fell to the ground. So uh, when this Jesus of Nazareth, shows himself in his divinity the very word that he's speaking you know which is which is conveying his divinity they're unable to bear it and they draw back and they actually fall to the ground that should have been a clear indication to, to them that what they are doing what they're about to do is very very wrong they have literally been impacted by just the name of God being uttered, where they literally draw back and they fall to the ground. So that itself should have you know, made them aware that what they're about to do is actually a very great spiritual crime. And still they go ahead with uh, you know, what they have planned. Uh, so we see that uh, after Jesus speaks and he says, I am, uh, they fall to the ground. And so then he repeats again, you know, who is it you want? And again, they reply to him and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then in verse 8, Jesus said, I told you I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. OK, so um, here, uh, here we see that the soldiers who have come are from the chief priests. It says that in verse 3. So these are not Roman soldiers who have come over here to arrest Jesus. It is the uh, temple guard, you know, the, the 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 soldiers and the guards who were who used to guard the temple premises um, uh, because of all the silver and gold which is there inside. So it's that temple guard which has come to do the arresting. 
because if Roman soldiers had come to do the arrest, they would have taken Jesus to the to Pontius Pilate directly. But these soldiers, they take Jesus to the chief priest, which clearly shows us that is that it is the temple guard which has come to arrest Jesus. And so now Jesus speaks to this temple guard and he says to them, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. So Jesus' first concern is for the safety of his disciples. He says, you've come to arrest me. So go ahead and arrest me, but don't harm my disciples. Allow them to go. And um, um, it is at that point that Simon Peter takes out his sword and cuts off the high priest servant's ear. And then Jesus says to him in verse 11, Jesus says, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So Peter had made a promise. He had said, Lord, I'm willing to even die for you. You know, that's, that's what he had said. And so now, in accordance with his words, he takes out his sword to start fighting with his experienced temple guard. But Jesus says, no, I'm willing to drink the cup of, uh, of you know, sorrow and death, which the father has given me. So no, I will not be willing to fight. And so Pete, uh, Jesus heals the ear of that uh, man. Um, so moving on from there into verses 12 to 15, if we could have someone read out. Chapter 18, verses 12 to 15, please. Verse 12 to 15. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me. I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. 18, 12, well, 18. Yes. Well. Then, then the uh, detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they laid him away to Anas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest there that year. Now it was Caiaphas who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expended, expedient that one man should die for the pupil. Okay, all right. Uh, so now the soldiers, they bring Jesus to um, Annas, who is the father-in-law of the high priest. Who exactly is Annas? Annas used to be the high priest himself. And then when um, he began to gain a lot of political influence, the Romans remove him from his position because he's becoming way too powerful. And so they remove him from his position and they appoint his son-in-law as the high priest, Caiaphas. They appoint him as the high priest. But according to the Jewish law, when a high priest is appointed, he continues to be high priest right up to the point of death. So the people basically are not happy when they see the Romans doing this, you know, where they actually remove a high priest during his lifetime. And so they continue to respect Annas. And therefore, Annas continues to exercise a lot of power and influence. So they, the soldiers first take Jesus to the um, house of this um, Annas. Okay, So he, uh, Annas is the one who first um, tries Jesus. The first trial is done by uh, Annas, this man who has got a lot of influence. And this is what happens. Um, verses 19 to 23. So this is the trial which is taking place in front of Annas. Uh, verses 19 to 24, if you could read out, please. 19 to 24. Verse 19 to 24. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always meet. 
and in secret i have said nothing why do you ask me ask those who have heard me what i said to them indeed they know what i said and when he had said these things one of the officers who stood by stuck jesus with the palm of his hand saying do you answer the high priest like that jesus answered him if i have spoken evil we are witness of the evil but if well why do you strike me then anas sent him bound to caiphas the high priest so the right now at this stage uh, what anas is trying to do is he's trying to catch hold of some teaching of jesus which he can use you know as an instigation uh, to ask for a death sentence so he starts questioning jesus about uh, his disciples and his teaching uh, he's trying to find some loophole which he can use to say oh my what you're saying is very very wrong and so you should be given the death sentence so jesus is very well aware why he's questioning him about all of his teachings so jesus very plainly he says why are you questioning me ask those who heard me surely they know what i said because he said you know all these days i have not been teaching in secret i have been openly teaching in the synagogues and in the temple and everyone has been listening so uh, it's uh, so why are you asking me now like as if you never heard my teachings before you know my teachings have been openly proclaimed everywhere for everyone to hear and he, and jesus says i said nothing in secret so uh he says surely they know what i said all the people are aware of what i have said and up to now no one has been able to find any defect in what jesus has spoken he has not spoken anything which has gone against uh, you know the mosaic covenant so therefore jesus says why are you uh, asking like as if i'm going to come up with some new teaching which will go against the mosaic covenant and because jesus back answers in this manner an official slaps jesus in the face and says is this the way you answer the high priest and then jesus says if i said anything wrong testify as to what is wrong but if i spoke the truth why did you strike me so uh, anas is not able to find anything any loophole in anything which jesus has said and so now he sends um jesus next to uh, to his son in law caiaphas okay so the next part of the trial takes place in front of um caiaphas and uh, the details of that we are not given over here in this gospel of john we find it in the other gospels uh, from here um john directly takes us to pontius pilate and the trial which takes place over there um let us look at verses 31 yeah uh, if we could have someone read out for us verses 31 to 35 yes verses 31 to 35 yes then pilot said to them you take him and judge him according to your law therefore the jews said to him it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke signifying by what death he would die then pilot entered the praetorium again called jesus and said to him are you the king of the jews Jesus answered him are you speaking for yourself on this or did others tell you this about me pilate answered him i am i a jew your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you to me what have you done okay so um, after jesus undergoes trial under the religious leaders and they are not able to find any loophole they send him to pontius pilate because pontius pilate is the uh, roman appointee he is the governor of judea he is he alone has the legal authority to give a death sentence the 
religious leaders do not have the right to give a death sentence to anyone so they have to get um, permission from the roman governor so now they have brought jesus over here to pontius pilate and pontius pilate starts his questioning um, pontius pilate was never interested in the religious matters of the jews uh, he was only mainly interested in you know holding on to his political position and uh, so he does not really care about uh, the reasons the the, re the religious reasons with which the you know chief priests have brought jesus over here and uh, so he basically asks jesus one question uh, he, in verse 33 he says to jesus are you the king of the jews is only interested in that one matter he does not care about all the uh, all the loopholes in the teachings you know which the um, which the religious leaders are you know now artificially concocting he's not interested in all of that he has basically one thing in mind he wants to know whether there is any political threat to the uh, to this particular province of judea and so he asks uh, jesus this question in verse 33 he says are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus says to him, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? So now Jesus is giving this Pontius Pilate an opportunity to maybe consider who he is and maybe you know choose to receive him as Lord and Savior. So Jesus says to him, uh, who put this idea in your head that maybe I am the king of the Jews? Is it something which someone told you? Or is it something that you are sensing in your own heart? You know, is, is what Jesus is asking here. And then Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? So, you know, Peter, um, so Pilate just kind of, you know, um, brushes off what Jesus is trying to say. Uh, he is not um, really concerned about spiritual matters and so then in verse 36 jesus says my kingdom is not of this world if it were my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the jewish leaders but now my kingdom is from another place so jesus assures him and says no i my you know the, my kingdom is not of this world if i were interested in establishing a worldly kingdom i would have fought and I would have allowed even my disciples to fight. So that's the reason why Jesus did not permit Peter to fight in the garden. Because he's not interested in establishing any physical kingdom, any earthly kingdom. He is planning on establishing an eternal kingdom one day, which will last forever and ever. He is not interested in any temporary human kingdom. So Pontius Pilate's main concern is, is there any threat to the Roman Empire? Is somebody trying to come to political power? Is someone trying to overthrow the Roman rule? So that is his only concern. So he asks, are you the king of the Jews? And this is Jesus' reply. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, but now my kingdom is from another place, is what Jesus says. Um, and um, so, in response to that, uh, okay, yeah, I think, okay, it's our break time. All right, we'll, when we come back from the break, we'll continue uh, with, uh, with the conversation which happens after this. Thank you. <laughs> 